Massive income versus passive income is what we're going to be diving into on today's episode. You are listening to the Champion Hustle Podcast. Play to succeed in business and in life. Featuring Levi Hunsaker and Ryan Black. Welcome to the Champion Hustle Podcast. My name is Ryan Black. And my name is Levi Hunsaker. And today in episode 11, we're going to be breaking down massive versus passive income, different strategies, and why you may want to do one over the other. But before we dive in, I think we have a correction to share, don't we, Levi? Yes. Yeah, so uh, we meant to mention this on our last uh, investing episode, talking about real estate, but you know we just got going in it and just slipped our minds. So what we want to do is we want to issue a correction. In there, we were talking about the rule of 72, and so now I will remove the foot from my mouth and just <laughs> say that the rule of 72 really is is a ballpark estimate, right? It's a, it's a quick estimate, so you can kind of see what kind of return you're going to get and, and how long it's going to take you to double your money, but that return really only holds true when you're sitting maybe up to 10 to 12%. When you start getting higher than that, you start to get further and further away from that. So when you're talking about getting high returns in the 70 plus percent range, the, the rule of 72 is not going to hold anymore. Yeah, it doesn't so, work. Yeah, we just wanted to to make that correction and let you guys know, hey, we, we forgot to say that. We want to make that correction and say, hey, you know what? We, we make mistakes sometimes, and so we want to we want to make it right. Amen. Well, the thing is, is in real estate, right? We're, we're used to much higher returns. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, maybe that's why. But, you know, it is, it is what it is. I, uh, I was chatting with a buddy yesterday, one of our mutual friends, and uh, he was getting, it was over a 100% return on his money in uh, some investing that he did on one of his properties within the first year. It's like, that's what I'm talking about. That's why we love real yes, estate. it is. Right? And, uh, and so today, as we talk about breaking down you know, massive versus passive income, when we refer to massive, we're talking about a large quantity of money all at once versus passive, which is a smaller quantity of money, but it comes in over time. But whether or not the money comes in is independent of whether we're actually physically there or, or you know, virtually there managing the project because it's, it's more, it's like a money machine, right? It's automatic. And so we want to go through kind of some examples about those. But before we dive into that, um, I kind of want to go through some questions because a lot of times, and I'm sure you've experienced this as well, Levi, in talking with different people who are saying, you know, what, I'd really like to get into real estate investing or it's something that interests me. They, um, you know, well, I think I want to do this strategy or that strategy because I saw it on TV or whatever or read about it online. You really need to do a self-assessment first and understand what we refer to as your investor ID. Could you could you expand a little bit on that? What is what is your investor ID? Yeah, so investor ID really is basically uh, what is best for you. Everybody has a unique set of strengths and abilities, and they're coming from a different place. So if you start to look at it and you say, you know what? I'm gonna start asking myself the questions, well, what is my current financial situation? If I don't have the finances, that might dictate to me what kind of investing strategy I'm going to start with so that I can get the right financing for the strategy that I do want to be doing. You know? Right. And what and what is your need, right? Are you in a situation where you're saying, you know, I need to to do this because I gotta put food on the table. Or is all that already taken care of? And are you simply saying, you know what, I want to increase my net worth, right? Where are you at currently? Right. And and likewise with that, looking where you're at currently, it's looking at where do you want to be? What are your goals, right? Short term, one, five, 10, 15 year, where do you want to be when you hit retirement age? And and so mapping that out, that's going to determine what type of investing. It's definitely not one size fits all. So you gotta see where are you now and where do you wanna be? Yeah, and, and really, how much time do you have? As you're getting started, how much time do you have to dedicate to your investments? If you, yeah. if you don't have a lot of time, well, certain strategies may not be for you. Yeah, because there, there definitely is a difference. Some of them require a lot more time, some less. And so, you know, in that same vein, how much time do you have? It's how much liquid capital do you have? Now, I want to clarify on this because you 
do need money to invest in real estate, obviously. But it doesn't have to be your money. And so depending on how much liquid capital you personally have or how much liquid capital you have access to through private investors and other sources, uh, or maybe even bank financing, right? How much capital do you have access to will definitely kind of uh, dictate what direction you might want to head or another because, uh, well, you got to have capital. It just depends on where you're going to acquire it from and, uh, and for how long. How long are you going to be using it? Yeah, and, and really big with this understanding your investor ID is you want to understand who you are and who you want to serve. Mm-hmm. When, when you can get really clear on that, the, the type of investor you want to be is going to get really clear. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to jump right into that strategy right away, but it's really important to have that as the end that's 100% in the front of your mind. And everything that you're doing is actually to get you towards that type of investing. Right. Well, and 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 I like that when you, you talk about who do you want to serve, because there's a lot of different, we kind of like to use the, and I think we've mentioned this before, the differentiation of, of Walmart, Target, and Nordstrom. I think, didn't Nordstrom go bankrupt? Um, I don't know. I never shopped there, so maybe <laughs> I'm part of the problem. <laughs> I think they did recently in the last few months, but anyways the the example still works right the uh, the analogy still works you got your walmart houses that are kind of your lower end uh, cheaper materials cheaper price certain type of neighborhood you got your target they're a little more expensive a little nicer a little nicer finishes um, and so your customer who's going to be working with that type of property or buying it or renting it or whatever um, they have certain expectations and certain things they're looking for and then your nordstrom or the more of the high end you can buy a t-shirt at walmart you can buy a t-shirt at target you can buy a t-shirt at at uh, Nordstrom, the price is going to vary, right? Considerably. What's a $5 yep. shirt at Walmart is probably a $50 shirt at Nordstrom or whatever. And so, um, you know, there's value in all three areas, but who do you want, like you said, Levi, who do you want to serve and what challenges do you want to face? Because regardless of what strategy we, we look at, there's going to be challenges, right? All investing has different challenge, unique challenges that we face. And so, each of those different types of properties, the challenges are very unique. And so you really kind of have to pick and choose and say, what type of people do I want to serve? Do I want to get that first time home buyer who's just getting started and you know can barely scrape up the down payment and they're really struggling to, to qualify with the bank? Or do you want to be working with that person who's buying their fifth or sixth property right, or, or, or home and they've been through the process, they know what they want and they're a little more demanding on certain things? But, uh, you know, if they need to come with an extra thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 down, not a problem. They can come up with it. So every single situation is a little bit different. Yeah. Another, another thing to, to consider, another question to ask yourself is relationships, right? You're looking at oh, the capital yes. you have, but what kind of relationships do you have? Who do you know? We've all heard, you no, know, it's not what you know, but who you know. Kind of. It's what you know and who you know <laughs> that makes the difference it's exactly. both it's not they're not mutually exclusive it's so important to have the right knowledge but also to have the right relationships and uh you know they're obviously in what we do in real estate investing there are other professionals who support us right I and mean, we've got a title title agents and insurance agents and real estate agents and attorneys accountants inspectors contractors um i mean there's we got a plethora of people who have their specific, um, you know, their specific focus of what they do, and they support us in what we do. So we got to have those right professional relationships. So that's kind of one side of the equation, is having those people that uh, we create a win-win, complementary, you know, business, a strategic partnership with them. So you're both winning. And then on the other side is what kind of relationships, meaning friendships, do you have? What other folks do you know who are in the industry? who have either just getting started or have been doing it for a long time that are experiencing, who are learning, who are having, you know, growth opportunities as they go through the different transactions. Because as you net, and we've talked about this on past episodes, but when you network with other people who are in the same industry, so, so powerful, right? Don't see those other people as competitors. They're only competitors if you want them to be, especially in real estate. There is, there are plenty of houses to go around. <laughs> If you get networked with other people who have the right mindset and are able to support you in what you're doing, man, it can make all the difference in being able to support not only you, but them. Rising tides 
they raise all ships. Yeah, and on the relationships, that used to be something that I used to look at and think, man, it's all about who you know, and I hated that concept of somebody basically got favors because of who they knew. And that's not what it's all about at all. What building relationships is about is having the right knowledge and the right people in your lives that when the right opportunity comes along, that you can actually put something together together with these relationships and actually build um, a, a deal, build a win-win yeah. situation for everybody. It's about creating. It's not about uh, taking something away from somebody else. Yeah, that's that's what it is. And and those, you know, in in the the analysis or the self analysis of identifying, okay, who am I as an investor? What's my investor ID? Um, you know, and there's and there's more questions, but that's kind of a good good place to get you started on those those types of questions of figuring out, okay, what type of investing. Now knowing that, now we can go into and say, okay, well, do we want to sit on the side of massive or passive? Another way that I think we can refer to it is massive investing strategies are typically more active investing strategies. There are strategies where you are actively involved in the transaction in some way or another, right? Whereas passive investing is more, well, passive strategies. So, so we kind of use those terms interchangeably, massive passive or active passive, because you're either an active investor or a passive investor, right? Yeah. One of the ways that I like to look at massive is you're talking about getting a lump sum, a big chunk of cash at one time. That's, what you're, that's what you're creating in your business. Ooh, a mountain of money. I want one of those. Uh, yes. Let's go make a money mountain. <laughs> <laughs> so money mountain. What are some ways, what are some of your favorite strategies, Levi, for making money mountains? Money Active mountains. Well, so the first one, this is where... It's the obvious one, right? This is this is the sexy one. This is the one that's, you know, you see on all the HGTV shows, right? Yep. It's flipping. Flipping is a great strategy. You're going to buy a house for a great deal and then make sure that there's enough equity or margin from what you could sell it for when you're done and make a mountain of money. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's popular. And there is, I mean, there's great opportunities. Flipping is great. We know lots of people who do it. We do it. Um, yep. It's fun, does have its challenges, but it's a great way to be able to get massive income. Another uh, strategy that's similar to flipping, and sometimes people confuse it, is flipping contracts. So you're talking about fixing and flipping an actual property and rehabbing it, whereas flipping contracts is similar yet different. Flipping contracts is also referred to as wholesaling, where you are actually taking a property, putting it under contract for purchase, but before you take acquisition of the property, you wholesale or flip that contract over to another investor. Now, by doing this, the benefit is you as the wholesaler, you don't have to do anything to the property. You don't have to touch it. You never take possession of it. You don't have to pay for the acquisition, right, to purchase it. You put a little bit of a earnest money down, but I mean, you recoup that when you wholesale the contract back and then some. And uh, basically the spread between what you've got it under contract for and what you flip it for to another investor is your profit margin. So there's, uh, it's a great strategy. It's quick. Like it doesn't take, once you actually have the deal, it's quick to be able to flip that contract out to another investor. Typically the challenge of why we say wholesaling is an active strategy is because you got to do the lead gen, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, door campaigns or mailing campaigns or, you know, online campaigns, there's a lot of, it requires a lot of outreach to, you know, if you're doing it on a mass scale, wholesaling, to be able to contact lots and lots of people so that they, you'll find those people who are willing and uh, eager to sell their property and close, you know, within a week for cash. Um, they're out there, but it does require a lot of time. So wholesaling is still, would still be considered an active strategy, uh, wholesaling or flipping of the contracts. Yeah. And it's, it's probably one of the more time intensive ones, right? So what you're doing is you're trading your time and your knowledge, for your mountain of money. But like you said, it's, to turn these contracts, it doesn't take very much time when you have the right knowledge and you have the right relationships. Yep. So, awesome. Well, the next one, 
and and this is a fairly common one, but not a lot of people do it. This is land development. Mm, you basically one. can flip dirt. And the cool thing about land development is you can flip it at any time in the process. Basically, you can get in, you can work with the city, you can get a plan approved, you can flip it, you can actually go in and do some of the development, put some uh, utilities and services on the land, and then flip it, or you can just keep carrying through each phase of the project. So land development is a pretty cool one. I know somebody who's made over six figures just buying, working with the city to get something rezoned and selling a contract on land. That is awesome. I was actually looking yesterday at a parcel here uh, in a nearby city. You may have also seen that deal come across your I've desk. I've seen it. It just yeah. dropped 50K. Yeah, it did. They just <laughs> dropped it 50K. And I was looking at it and I was interested, but I don't know if you noticed, but that parcel, it's like on a cliff. Yep. <laughs> so I said, nope, I don't want to deal with that. I'm sure you there's somebody. a <laughs> massive investment in a retaining wall. In a retaining wall and the pylons. The pylons yep. to be able to and, and now this is something that what, that's important because when we're looking like I wouldn't build the house there. My strategy, my plan was, oh, if this works, hey, we'll buy it. We'll do land development. Exactly what you just said. We'll get it all ready for somebody else to purchase the land and go and start building. But knowing that, hey, whoever buys this from me, they're going to have to put in another hundred and fifty thousand dollars in in uh, you know pylons and retaining walls and all or more just to be able to build a house on the lot. It was a great lot. It's big, but thinking I, yeah, that's a major, challenge that I don't want to face. That does not align with my investor ID for not as big of a return. Yeah. Yeah. So, so land development is great. And, uh, you know, right after land development, like you said, if you want to continue with something, well, new builds, right? You could do new construction where, uh, either if you personally have acquired that land and then you're seeing it through or, um, you know, and did the development and now you're doing the build or maybe it was already pre-developed and you're just ready to start building or maybe you purchase an old house, demo the house and then rebuild something new in its place. Um, you know, we've seen that as well, but uh, time consuming, lots of permits with the city, inspections, all that stuff. Um, but you can have some great, if it's in the right place, right time and uh, you know, you got it's a very active strategy. I think everybody understands that. Building a house is very active. <laughs> it's yeah, kind of self-explanatory. One of my favorite stories on this actually is, uh, you know, a mutual person that we know. They, they basically did what you were talking about. They bought a house and basically demolished the house, but they were going to keep the foundation. But as they got into it, the foundation was just more and more destroyed. And oh, they ended up keeping like a 10 by 10 section of the foundation. <laughs> and building a new house around it, like nothing was sitting on the old foundation. And it was essentially a new build, but the city considered it a renovation. Yes. So they didn't have a lot of the expenses that were associated with it. So really it comes down to being creative with your strategy and really communicating with the city officials. And you can do a ton of amazing things. I remember that story. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, technically, it's not a new build because you're still 10 by 10 from the original and, and the city passed it. They were fine with exactly. that. Exactly. So uh, the, the next one, this one is uh, one that's been pretty hot in the last few years, but yeah. has kind of gotten a little crazy scary during COVID, and that is short-term rentals. So mm -hmm. getting into the Airbnbs and VRBOs, um, people are still making money doing these things because they pivoted. They pivoted their customers um, mm -hmm. They've pivoted into like traveling medical professionals or traveling business people that have extended into longer term stays. So it's it's not about the strategy. It's about how you implement it on whether it's going to be effective for you or not. Yeah. And, and to play devil's advocate here, you know, short term rentals uh, can be a passive strategy if you fully automate the system, right? If you're fully automated where you have a, uh, you know, a manager and everyone that's, you're completely hands off. I, I know people who, who run it that way. Obviously their profit margins a lot less, but they are hundred percent hands off. So short term rentals could almost be either way, depending on how you run the business. It could be an active strategy where you're going to be, I mean, if it's going well, you're going to be at that property two, three times a week, potentially, or 
It could be very passive and you never go there ever because you've got all the right people in place. So different, yep. different, different ways. And last but not least, massive strategies, brokering notes. Now notes is another one that's, that's tricky because it you know, can kind of go either way. But when we're talking about brokering notes, that is you being the middleman between the buyer and the seller of the note because that requires, once again, like, like wholesaling, reaching out to people, doing that outbound marketing, contacting them, and, and connecting and introducing the buyer and the seller. As a wholesaler, you're introducing the buyer and seller of a property. As a note broker, you're introducing the buyer and seller of a note or a debt against a property. And so, um, you, you know, you make your spread or your fee on that. It can, be, it can be very lucrative, but it does require active work. The nice thing about note brokering is if you're in a, a situation where maybe, um, you know, going out and about is just not simply uh, feasible for you because of oh, a health. Oh, you mean like right now? Ah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because of health concerns or, or whatever, right? You, but you can work from home. Note brokering can be... Can be a sweet deal, sweet gig, because you you got a laptop, you got a, a phone, you're good to go. Bunny so. slippers, my friend. Bunny yes. slippers. Oh, of course, and you got to have your bunny slippers. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. So those are kind of some of the the more common ways to do massive income. Um, you can put t- these strategies together in lots of combinations. Get creative. You know, there's no limit besides your imagination on this kind of stuff. So the next thing that we're gonna dive into is passive income. When we talk about passive income, this is what we like to talk about as mailbox money. We're talking about minimal involvement. Now, we wanna be involved enough that we can take advantage of some of the tax advantages of being an active investor, but we like to to minimize that involvement because that's when the the true time freedom and the flexibility comes into play when when you can really do it passively, when you can get your mailbox money, or really, now that these days it's all just wire transferred into your account, so you don't have to worry about it. Yep. You could do that in Hawaii, you could do that in you know, Key West, Florida, you could do that in the Maldives, it doesn't matter where you are. So yeah. let's talk about some common passive strategies, Ryan. So probably the most common one that everyone thinks of when they think of mailbox money is rentals, right? Traditional rentals. And I know we've talked about rentals in other episodes. We love rentals, all the benefits that they bring. And uh, yeah, traditional, residential, whether you're, you know, talking about, you know, single family homes, uh, you know, twin homes, condos, duplex, fourplex, 20plex, whatever it is, uh, rentals, people need a place to live. And so traditional rental properties can be a very, very powerful passive income strategy. Plus they get all the other benefits on the side. So I know you're a big fan. I'm a huge fan of rentals and um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're time tested. They're always going to be around. (laughs) They've always been here. They're always going to be there. And so it's a great investment. One that we absolutely love as passive investment. Yeah. Um, Another fun one is commercial. Now, There are good things and bad things to each type of property, right? Because Mm -hmm. one of the big things that got hit during COVID was commercial properties. Um, Businesses decided that, hey, you know what? We can actually operate without giant warehouses or without giant office buildings. And so they started pulling out. And so it's just a different type of investment. You have a different type of customer that you're going to serve in your commercial real estate investments. But... One of the cool advantages of commercial investments is you're not going to get the same um, challenges that a a residential tenant is going to have. And really, they're going to take on all of the expenses with something called a triple net lease in commercial real estate. They will actually take on uh, your taxes, insurance, all this kind of stuff. So they're paying everything and your profit margins go up. They even pay to renovate the buildings. Yeah, yeah, they build it out themselves. Well, and... And this is interesting. And maybe, maybe at some point in the future, we could have an episode dedicated to just talking about commercial and the changes that we're seeing in the marketplace. Because as you know, we mentioned about Nordstrom, and, and I know there have been big box stores that have gone bankrupt during, you know, during COVID. And one thing that's interesting to see is kind of the secondary and tertiary effect of that is particularly when we look at like strip malls. 
right? In strip malls, typically you have what's known as an anchor store, and maybe that's a grocery store or a you know a large department store or something like that. And then you have all the smaller little shops. The anchor store is what really sustains the strip mall. And I'm sure everyone, we've all seen abandoned strip malls where they're just ghost towns, right? And usually that starts when the anchor store leaves because either because they've gone bankrupt, you know, like Kmart or, you know, any of the other big stores that used to have anchor store locations all around the country, or they, you know, move to another location and nobody moves in little by little most people are drawn by that big anchor store to the shopping center. And then when they're there, they're like, oh, hey, let's stop and get a bite to eat here. Or, oh, I didn't know they had dry cleaning place here. I'll stop in there. And so it's just as a side note, it's going to be interesting to see the kind of the repercussions of that as, like you mentioned, the changes and the impact on commercial real estate. Um, there could be some incredible opportunities here in the near future for us because of that shifting the, sh- the shifting marketplace with commercial property. We've we've done investments in commercial before, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see to see moving forward what uh, what new opportunities pop up that maybe never existed before. Yep. M- multifamily is uh, you know I guess it's kind of multifamily is kind of could fall under traditional rentals too. When we talk about multifamily, uh, you know we got duplex, triplex, fourplex. I'm up to hundreds of units in a you know in a complex. And uh, there are definitely different challenges and different benefits with multifamily. A few quick ones is when you're dealing with multifamily, um, you know, if you're if you're going to renovate one unit, you could renovate multiple units at the same time, and it's easy because they're all right there next to each other. If you have maintenance challenges, especially if it's a larger complex, you're just kind of an on-site maintenance man or person that, that that's there and that handles everything. So you can have on-site managers especially with the larger ones. And so there are some, obviously there's an operating cost to that, but there's also a convenience to where you don't have to worry that, oh, I've got to go and call a plumber or have my, you know, have my manager call a plumber to get him out there to get to, you know, take a look at this issue. You've already got somebody on site that as soon as there's an issue, that same day, usually they're there and they take care of it. No problem. So, and there are challenges to multifamily. You've got a lot of people kind of collected in one small area. So, you know, noise complaints and, uh, you know, vandalism and theft and other things. You can see a rise in some of those issues as well when you're dealing in a multifamily situation. Depends on the neighborhood, of course. But um, so once again, there's good, there's bad. Simply choose what works, what makes the most sense for you. Yeah. And one thing to think about is when you look at multifamily, it's kind of a hybrid between single family and commercial. So it's valued and has a lot of the, some of the similar properties of a commercial property, but who you're serving is individuals and families still instead of businesses. That's true, I never thought of it that way, but yeah, it absolutely is, it's a hybrid. Yeah, all right, so the next one, we talked about in massive income brokering notes. Now we're gonna actually talk about being on the note side of things, so being the lender. Now, I've done some deals like this and it's kind of a fun strategy because it's the passive income, right? You're just earning an interest rate. You have a, a loan that you lend out on a property, you get secured on the title, and they just have to pay you the percentage that you agreed on. That money mountain. That oh, money. wait, no, this is passive, no mountain. That, it's more like a money, money stream. Hill? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. The money molehill. <laughs> but eventually yeah. we'll make a mountain out of the molehill. Yes. And it'll be a gushing river, a massive river going into the ocean. Oh, le- yeah, lending lending is so powerful. And, uh, you know, one one strategy that, and I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Can't remember who it was. Anyways, a very interesting strategy, tax liens. This is something that a lot of people don't even know about or even know exists. We all understand if you own a property, you have property tax that's owed to the county on an annual basis. Now, what happens if somebody uh, refuses or forgets or is unable to pay that property tax? Well, then the county will place a lien against the property. The interesting thing is, is it doesn't matter what, regardless of what other liens are on that property, the tax lien will always default to first position. It will supersede everything else. And so this tax lien is because the government wants to be paid their money for the property. 
Now, as investors, we can actually go in and purchase these tax liens. And they're very unique because, in effect, the government is guaranteeing a return on that money that you invest in the lien. They're saying, look, purchase this lien, and then you're going to, we're going to back it up by this real estate with a, you know, specified rate of return. And there's different ways. Every, every county is a little bit different, but you will know what the rate of return is, is that you're going to get. And so let's say you, you purchase a property and, and it's a $10,000 tax lien, right? They owe $10,000. And so what you do as the investor, you go in, you pay the 10, and then that money goes to the county to satisfy the money that they're owed. But then they effectively have transferred the rights of the interest that is accruing on that, on that money owed now is going to go to you. So once the homeowner comes in and redeems the tax lien, meaning that they come and say, okay, I'm ready to pay my taxes. How much is it? They'll say, well, you owe $10,000 in principal on back taxes, plus who knows, $1,000 in fees to the county. That goes to the county as administration for administrative costs. Plus, however, it depends on how long you've had it, but you know, $500 or $1,000 or whatever in interest on the amount owed. And guess who gets that interest? You do as the investor. So it's a really cool strategy, very passive. I mean, there's a little bit of work to find it and, and bid on it or to purchase the, you know, the tax liens. But once you get them, you can buy them in retirement accounts. You know, you can buy them uh, just straight up, but there are a really, really, it's a definitely a long-term strategy, a passive strategy. And, um, a great way to get a, a killer return on your money. If you're saying, you know, I don't need to touch this money for a while, buy some tax liens. Yeah, most tax liens that I've seen are double digit returns. And what oh, yeah. happens if they do not redeem the tax lien? <laughs> In most places, that means you're going to get the property. <laughs> the property, well, then you'll become the owner of the property. So you won't, uh, you know, you won't be reimbursed for the money that you put into the lien. But who cares? <laughs> If you just put $10,000 or whatever in to buy a tax lien, then you wait five years and then they say, well, this was never redeemed. Guess what? The property's now yours. You just bought yourself a house for 10 grand. Yep. So now one of the things that a lot of people don't are, are not familiar with tax liens is when somebody gets a loan on a, a property, that loan gets, goes in first position. But most cases, um, well, all cases, tax liens go before the first position lender. In a lot of cases, HOAs go before the first position lender as well. Yes, and HOAs can actually foreclose on a property. I've seen it happen. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, kind of crazy. Why do I live in an HOA? I don't know. <sighs> Get out, save yourself while you can. <laughs> I'll, I'll just make sure I pay my bills. Yeah, so. uh, and short-term rentals, you know, we, we talked about that. The that it could be, you know, it could be active or it could be passive when you have it set up, set up, uh, you know, correctly with the right team and the right managers in place. Yeah. Anything, anything else? Um, the last one we want to talk about is seller financing or contract for deed. Now, um, there's, I've seen investors, they come in and they actually find buyers first, buyers that can't qualify for a traditional bank loan. And what they do is they agree to, basically purchase the property for them or purchase the property, not for them, but they purchase the property and then they turn around and sell it on seller financing or contract for deed. Now, really the big difference between seller financing and contract for deed is when the title transfers. Yeah. Um, so just some, some technicalities, but they're very similar strategies in being able to become the bank on a property and collect the interest payments over time. Contract for deed. I like to think of contract for deed uh, to really make the comparison to buying a car with a car loan, right? Because when you buy a car and it has a loan, you don't receive the title. It goes to the financing company. And then once you've paid off the car loan, then you're basically making installment payments to, and then once that's satisfied in full, then they write the title over to you and you receive the title for the vehicle. So both great strategies. And, oh man, yeah, we could spend several episodes talking about that. <laughs> I love me some seller financing. It is yes. good. So, yeah. So, I mean, that's basically what we got for you today. We kind of wanted to hammer through, you know, different massive, different passive or active passive strategies. And it, it's tricky because I, I get a lot of people that ask, you know, well, what strategy should I do? What should I do? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> you need to 
identify your investor ID. I can't, I can't answer that for you. Your situation is very different than mine. It's very different from Levi's. It's a, I mean, we all have unique situations. And so the, really the kind of the key takeaway from today is if you're looking at different investment strategies and saying, okay, you know, what do I, what should I do? Um, step one, identify your investor ID, figure out everything, map it out so that you understand what it is you're looking for. And then you can, then you can kind of tie that into, oh, well, this is my situation. These are my needs. These are my goals. These are my resources. You know what? These couple of strategies make the most sense for me. And that will, you know, get you to where you want to get a heck of a lot faster. Yeah. And nobody else can run your business for you. You've got to figure out what you're willing to do and then go do it. So thanks for joining us today. And next week, we actually have a special guest coming in to join us. And we're going to be talking about business and life mix with Dr. Gary Lawrence. Oh, and he has some incredible life experience and has run several great businesses over his his uh, wise. He man is is he's great. You're going to love him. <laughs> Very intelligent. And uh, we look forward to learning from him. He's a good friend of ours. And uh, look forward to having you guys join us with him next week. So make sure you plug in championhustle.com. All the links are there and uh, we'll see you online. Take care, guys. Have a great week. Have see a great ya. week, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Champion Hustle podcast. For more great content and to join our online community, visit us at championhustle.com. Mm-hmm.